That's a beautiful Friday morning ride here. And it's time for us to look at you know, the world of sports. And this morning we'll be talking about the Premier League. Of course, it's a season where you have the men, some men, not all men, taking control of the remote. And it might just be difficult, you know, for the women in the house, but it's fine. So um, Monday Thomas is here with us and he joins the conversation. Monday, it's good to have you join us. A beautiful Friday morning. Yeah, it is uh, beautiful. And I must say it is a fantastic one, knowing that uh, tomorrow is match day two of the uh, English Premier League. I can't wait to get on with it. All right, then. So let's even start off with, you know, the entire Premier League is started off. And so far, what, what are your thoughts on, you know, the performance, everything that has happened so far? All right, match day one saw Arsenal beating Crystal Palace two goals to nil. That was the fixture uh, that, they, that they lost three goals to nil in uh, uh, one of their last games of last season. So it's starting in a way and it's giving some great vibes. And Arsenal fans all over the world are hopeful because of the very brilliant transfer window. And of course, you've got to give credit to the uh, uh, director of Arsenal football, a do former Arsenal player, invincible player. And of course, the current coach, Mikel Arteta, who's been doing tremendous work. We saw Liverpool, of course, uh, drawing in their first game against uh, Fulham at the Greven Cottage. But they will take lots of positive out of that game because uh, Darwin Nunes was off to a flying start, uh, scoring a goal and also providing an assist. Mo Salah, of course, uh, provided an assist and also scored. I mean, th these are quality players that always come up clutch for Liverpool. It might not have started so well for Liverpool, but no one should rule them out. You know, for certain, it's too early in the season. And early in Brad Haaland, what a way to announce your announce your season in the English Premier League, scoring twice against West Ham United. Chelsea, of course, beginning the season the way we expected them to, of course, struggling to a 1-0 victory uh, against Everton. Match day two promises to be more exciting. Arsenal will take on uh, Leicester City. Tottenham Hotspur will host the or Chelsea will host Tottenham Hotspur at, at the uh, Stamford Bridge. Manchester United, a very rocky start, a very gross start, and we, we all expected this. They are very busy in the transfer market now. The transfer market will close in September, and, till, and uh, Manchester United, we've heard them talking to Marco Anatovic. They are not talking to Maru Icardi. They are doing their very possible best to get signings, but I think it's going to be, at the end of the day, desperate signings, and they may make mistakes in the transfer window as it, come in, as it, it is coming to an end. But match day two in the English Premier League, I'm buzzing. Liverpool will be in action against, uh, I think, Brighton. And uh, they've not, I mean, Mo Salah has not scored a match day two goal in the English Premier League since he came uh, joining Chelsea and now playing for Liverpool. He has never scored in match day two. So for Liverpool fans, for people playing FPL, I don't think Mo Salah is the right person for you to captain uh, for match day two. I, I like the fact that you, you seem to have a thing for Liverpool and very uh, positive every time it comes to Liverpool. But let's, let's just start with that particular one. You've talked about the transfer season that probably would have affected, you know, the performances of some of this team in the English Premier League, for instance, Arsenal, like you have mentioned. Uh, but some people are saying that maybe the presence, uh, the fact that we do not have the presence of money any longer in Liverpool probably would be felt with all this going on. I know you have mentioned Salah in all of this, but do you think that Mane's present has been void now? And that's why, uh, you know, that Liverpool started off on that particular north of a draw. I, I beg to differ. I'm one person I don't go with the popular opinions. Of course, Amani was a prolific player. He's still a prolific player for Bayern Munich. But it doesn't mean Luis Diaz is any le anything less. Luis Diaz is world class. That Colombian is a machine. And it's just a matter of time this season. I think he will score more than uh, 15 goals in the English Premier League. That's just in the English Premier League season. You saw that first game against uh, Fulham. Uh, many people are expecting Lewis not to fit in the boots of Sadio Mane. I think he's going to. He's going to do. He's going to do just well. It just needs time. And when I talk time, I'm just looking at two games and two more games in the English Premier League. He's going to fit in that Lewis Diaz uh, in that uh, Sadio Mane's position. Lewis Diaz is just as good as Sadio Mane. And when you take a look at Liverpool's uh, scouting, they don't make mistakes in their scouting. I can remember Diogo Jota coming in from uh, Wolverhampton. People were talking about how, why is Liverpool going for Diogo Jota? He's now the talk of the all Anfield. Now they've gotten Darwin Nunes off to a flying start, the debut goal. Luis Diaz knows that uh, 
the pressure, the weight on uh, the absence of uh, Sadio Mane is on his shoulder. And I think he was going to step up to the plate. He's certainly going to rise up to the occasion. Mane is gone. Liverpool fans should, it should be bygones. I mean, stop talking about Mane. You can't bring him back. You can't talk about if Luis Diaz is going to fit in. Mo Salah is getting the job done. So even if, I, I think personally, Mo Salah can take up the, the job of Sadio Mane and him and the job of being Mo Salah. So for Liverpool fans, you guys have absolutely nothing to worry about. I'm not a Liverpool fan. I say you, you, you talked about me always being positive with Liverpool. I just love the kind of football they play. I think they're the best team in Europe. I, I think uh, Messi is being, <laughs> being sentimental here as a Liverpool fan to ask questions of Liverpool. Okay. No, I don't you know, think that's you, the case. Looking at the, the results, and maybe say we say they're losers, I think Liverpool can be said to be one of the losers on match day one, even though they didn't lose. But as uh, one of the top teams expected to, to beat a newly promoted team, they went and drew, that for them will be a loss. Um, let's look at some other losers. Uh, the big one, Manchester United. The one-time uh, theatre of dreams has now become a theatre of nightmares. Um, I'm mean, not that I'm complaining. I think uh, uh, it's a good time for me as an Arsenal fan to see what uh, Manchester United is going through. But what are your thoughts on what's going on at Old Trafford? I mean, Ten, Ten Hag was supposed to lead a revolution um, in a, a beginning of a new era. And it seems that things are not uh, you know, getting started the way it was expected. I also hear names like um, Anatovic and Raul Rabio being linked with Manchester United. And what I see online is that some Manchester United fans are not happy at all. What's happening right down there? All right, to add to what you just said, dreams do come true, and uh, so do nightmares, right? <laughs> so the nightmares are coming true right there at the uh, Theater of Dreams. But uh, that's just on a, uh, on a jovial note. I respect Manchester United. I respect them a whole lot. Especially in the times of uh, Salex Ferguson, I, I think they still have what it takes to be one of the biggest clubs in uh, England and, uh, and of course, uh, Europe. But what they are lacking is, uh, I, I think, they, they've lost their culture. I mean, the Manchester United culture is, was re result-oriented. I mean, they brought in Paul Pogba for some fancy footworks. They brought in Paul Pogba to help them sell jerseys. I mean, to help them for the commercial duties. They, were not, they brought in Cristiano Ronaldo to help them for commercials. But they were not really focused on uh, getting the needed result. Of course, they had a pretty much not so bad preseason. Of course, beating Liverpool and uh, going ahead to have a great time in Australia. But what is happening to them right now was expected. Because Christian Ronaldo has come out to say, I don't want to play for this club again. I don't want to be a part of this club. He has tried everything possible to leave. And now that he has not gotten any suitable buyer or Manchester United have not gotten any suitable offer for Cristiano Ronaldo, he's opted to remain there. For a player that I think he has lost zeal, he has lost absolutely everything to represent the Manchester United jersey, which I said it was a, before you wear the jersey, you need to, you need to be a cultured player. You need, to, you need to know what playing for Manchester United means. And it's quite unfortunate that Cristiano Ronaldo was a part of this culture and now he, he's, he's returning and he's trying to uh, disrupt the whole thing. I mean, you can remember the, the last game they played in the preseason where Cristiano Ronaldo was substituted in the first 45 minutes. He packed his bags and left the stadium. And guess what? He didn't leave alone. He left with Diogo Dalot. I mean, he left with other players. So this man has come in. He has completely not made that Manchester United camp to dressing room to, uh, to be won. And Eric Ten Hag is doing his possible best to make sure everyone is uh, collective. Everyone has his collective mindset because Cristiano Ronaldo is looking out for himself. He doesn't want to play in the Europa League and he wants to play in the top flight. So that's him being very selfish. Why don't you just be a selfless for some time, all right, look at the club being in a very, uh, very bad predicament and for you to help the club go back to top flight, but you want to leave. And mm. that doesn't speak well of Cristiano Ronaldo. So, 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 and that is certainly going to affect the way Manchester United yeah. play this season. They'll play Brentford and Brentford is not a very easy club to play against. So it's certainly going to be a tough season for Manchester United. They've been linked to players like uh, Marco Notovic this morning. I saw Mario Icardi. These are players who are off the radar. So um, I'd like us to be, I mean, it won't be fair that we talk about this and not talk about the fact that the Falconers actually recorded a victory, you know, one uh, zero victory against uh, France uh, in that particular game that happened on the 20 women's football team uh, victory. Uh, of their opening game of the 2022 FIFA Under-20 Women's World Cup in Costa Rica. 
Well, well, what do you make of this? Some people have said that you have a beautiful team uh, that has fantastic coach, if you want to begin to make comparison with that of the Super Falcons. Others are saying, hey, there were a lot of mistakes that were done, but I'd like to take your thoughts generally on that particular outcome. And not to forget the fact that whether or not it was a good, you know, we, we had uh, one or two loopholes, but, you know, victory was recorded. Well, we, we can't judge the Super Falcons based on the Falconets, uh, based on the Falconets' performance, because they say new level, new devil. The higher you go, the, uh, the higher the challenges. So let's leave the Super Falcons out of this, all right? Let's talk about the Falconets. Well, prolific team. Chris Danjuma, a prolific manager. I mean, in the qualification, uh, you know that. If you notice know that's uh, during the qualification, you know that a lot is expected from these ladies. They played seven games and they didn't lose any. They won six. And they scored about more than 15 goals. So this, this is a side that they've prepared for this tournament, although they didn't have enough adequate preparation when it comes to the friendly game. But in the qualifiers, they were prolific. The likes of Flores Sebastian, I mean, for her scoring the only goal of that particular game, that was well deserved because I can remember in the qualification, she scored a hat trick. She went on to score a brace. She was getting the goal. So a lot of people expecting a lot from her. And what? She lived up to the billing, scoring the only goal. A great pass from Mercy Idoku. I like to give credit to every part of the of the department right there in the uh, Falconets side. Chris Danjuma, quality manager. And in, in case you don't know, the Falconets have made it to every of the under-20 Women's World Cup. The last time they played in the finals was in 2014, where they lost to Germany. And guess what? They have made it to the knockout stages seven times out of the last eight. So we know we love women's football. The women's are always uh, doing greatly for us. Uh, in the just concluded Commonwealth Games, almost everyone was a lady who won the gold medal. So we, we have a lot to expect from the ladies. But from that game, beating France... Then a lot is expected from this, ladies. More, more is yet to come as we were looking at the next game on uh, Sunday where they'll be taking on South Korea. And, uh, and the last game is going to be against Canada. So they just need one win. South Korea, not a pushovers. Of course, beating uh, Canada, two goals to nil. So South Korea on top of Group C with Nigeria second uh, with goal difference. So on, on Sunday, we are going to see Nigeria qualify again to the knockout stages just as they love to do with a victory against South Korea. We have a whole lot to look out for, and this could just be the World Cup that will see the Falconers win, win it for the very first time. All right, all right, interesting. And uh, indeed, we look forward to seeing uh, these uh, games come fast and thick right there in Costa Rica. Uh, Monday, thank you very much for your time. time indeed, you said we're not here to troll, but you know, it's a fun aspect of football. Um, let's see how the weekend, uh, you know, pans out with the results from the EPL as well. We appreciate your time and look forward to seeing you again soon. Yeah, I'm always delighted every time we get to do, do this. So, of course, uh, match day two. I'll, I'll have some stats, though. I have some stats. I don't know if you have time. I told you Mo Salah's very, never scored. Very quickly, in a few seconds. Day. Yeah, in a few seconds. Okay. As I said, Mo Salah's never scored in the match day two of the English Premier League. And let me tell you something. Jamie Vardy has scored more goals against Arsenal in the English Premier League than he has against any other team. I know that should not make you happy, but he hasn't <laughs> scored in the past two appearances, but he has not gone three times without scoring against Arsenal. And this is for you. As an Arsenal fan, Kofi, I've got something for you. Uh, Gabriel Jesus loves playing against Leicester City. Out of seven games, he has scored five goals. And guess what? Gabriel Jesus has never lost a game against Leicester. Fantastic, fantastic. <laughs> Fantastic. I know you like scoring against, against Liverpool too. Uh, well, well let, let's see how this, let's today. see how all of this pans out. Especially where you, by the way, so we have to go now. Monday, Thomas, we great. have to go. Yes, yes. Thank you so much. We all appreciate right. you. It's always a delight. I mean, it's fun uh, having you do this with us every other time on Friday. That's the size of our conversation. If you missed out on any part of it, it will be all right to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and do subscribe to our YouTube channel. We're at Plus TV Africa and Plus TV Africa Lifestyle. My name is Messi Bofo. Have a great Friday. And my name is Kofi Bartel. Stay safe. We'll be back on Monday. Good morning.